Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me again here today. I'd like to start today by sharing that April is County Government Month. And I think everyone over this time has been learning a little bit more about the extent of the work that county government and its employees do and how important county government is to the health, the safety, and the vibrancy of Erie County. Today we have one new confirmed positive case in Erie County, and we have 516 negative tests reported. The new di newly diagnosed case is in their 80s and is a hospitalized patient who was tested once they became hospitalized and found to be positive. This case appears to be linked to travel. The investigations continue on this case and others, and overall contact tracing by Erie County Department of Health continues on all of those open cases. This is a perfect reminder that if anyone does have to travel and comes back to Erie, including people who might just be returning from being away for months in the South, you should self-quarantine for 14 days. This is just so, so important that when you come back to our community, you self-quarantine for 14 days. And if you're symptom-free after those 14 days, you still need to be staying at home like the rest of us, but you have the ability to be a little bit more uh, free and able to go to the grocery store and places like that. Social distancing is still the best way to prevent the spread because the easiest way to spread COVID-19 is person to person. Again, think about it as if everyone you come in contact with has COVID-19. They are out there, so act as if everyone has it. Please stay at home until you absolutely must go out, and if you must go out, take every precaution, the precautions that we have been talking about, don't touch your face. Practice proper hand washing and personal hygiene. I'm really happy to share that we have gone up another level when it comes to the social distancing report from Unicast. We went from a B minus to a B, and the arrow shows that we are continuing that positive trend. So let's keep raising that score here in Erie County. All of you out there that are doing the proper things when it comes to social distancing, you are helping us keep the spread of COVID-19 from happening across Erie County. One final note, our environmental team, a task force team, received 66 new complaints yesterday, and they continue to make uh, field inspections, campgrounds, golf courses, public swimming pools, and Airbnbs cannot operate, and they are being informed of that. If you need information or guidance, please check the resources page on the, on the ErieCountyPA.gov website under COVID-19 or call 814-451-6700 or email at ecdhinfo, I-N-F-O, at ErieCountyPA.gov. Regarding the state numbers, the state is now up to 47,698 negatives 7,016 positives, and unfortunately, 90 deaths across the Commonwealth. This is a 1,210 increase in the cases overnight within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and 16 additional deaths, deaths over the past 24 hours. With that said, I think it's a good time to invite our healthcare partners here to say a few words. So today with us, we have three in the studio with us and one by phone, Emily Shears from UPMC, Monsignor David Rubino from Lecom Health, Dr. Wayne Jones from Allegheny Health Network, and on the phone, Doreen Summers from the Veterans Hospital. So first, we're gonna start with Emily Shears from UPMC Hammett. Emily. Thank you. Um, so we want you to know in the community that we're ready at UPMC now in the future to protect our patients, staff, and communities. As you know, our UPMC Hammett collection site on West 3rd opened last Tuesday, March 24th, and is operating smoothly and safely. It's been well received by our patients and our clinicians. We've tested more than 200 individual, I'm sorry, 250 individuals to date, which have all been referred with a prescription from their physician. 
Our telemedicine visits have quickly increased over the past two weeks, which is working well for us and our patients. And we are rapidly expanding our telemed capabilities across the system for unscheduled care, primary care, cancer care, long-term care, and other needs. And our virtual visits have increased 300%. We're in regular contact with our partners at local, state, and federal public health authorities. When we have questions, we receive very prompt replies and we appreciate the guidance. We've had extensive communication with our employees to share they, what they need to know and explain UPMC's preparedness and policies. We've had several in-person and live um, chat sessions with our employees. Our clinical care areas used for COVID-19 patients follow CDC recommendations for providing care in a negative airflow environment. For protection of staff and patients, we do have a restricted visitation policy in place. And most importantly, we are ready now and in the future to protect our patients, our staff, and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And now I would like to invite up to the microphone Dr. Wayne Jones from St. Vincent Hospital, Allegheny Health Network. Dr. Jones? Dr. Kathy, thank you for having me. So at St. Vincent now, we're leaving our planning uh, phase and in our sustainment phase of operations. So in saying that, we do have some static operations going on, but let me just remind the public what we do have uh, going on if they do come to our facility. Um, we do have reduced public entrances, both for public and for employees, and as they come in, we do screen them. So uh, expect that if you come on to any of our campuses, especially our main campus, uh, we have plenty of protective equipment for our employees, uh, but we are looking to our suppliers, our, our sustainment of supplies uh, going forward, and we're very confident we'll be able to have enough supplies to keep everybody healthy uh, if you come to our facility. Uh, we are doing some ongoing uh, COVID testing, uh, both in the hospital uh, and for the public. Our West Side Pavilion is open seven days a week, and we're doing daily testing there. That is on a scheduled basis uh, through a prescription by your primary care physician and you can re receive testing from there. Um, I would like to give two thank yous out uh, to individuals in our community. The first one is for the Erie County Department of Health. I can tell you that uh, from early February when we had our tabletop drills, uh, we did our pre-planning, we did our dry run drills, they were involved. They were involved early on with when we did testing, tracking individuals, they really did help mitigate much of the disease in the county and they've done a fantastic job uh, as a partner to St. Vincent. Uh, I'd also like to thank Kathy Dahlkemper and her team. I can tell you from uh, every piece of planning she has done, uh, from uh, the mitigation planning, uh, stopping St. Patrick's Day, reducing uh, public interaction, uh, they have really flattened the curve and they've really improved the health uh, for Erie County. So I wanna thank them for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. And thank you for that nice compliment for the health department and for myself. I really appreciate that. Um, next, we're going to invite Monsignor David Rubino from LECOM Health up to speak from their perspective. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I want to echo Dr. Jones's congratulations to the county executive. These are difficult times. You have to make it up as you go along, and I think the county executive and her team have made it up exquisitely well over these last three or four difficult weeks. Relative to LECOM Health, I'm happy to report that at Mill Creek Community Hospital in Quarry, we've had no cases and no patients. We've tested about 120 people and they have all come up negative. We've seen increased traffic on our telemedicine and telehealth ports and we invite anyone who's interested to check us out on the webpage and we can take care of your need. The senior living centers and all the nursing homes equally report zero cases and zero patients and the new LECOM nursing and rehab unit, the special unit we opened with 12 beds has blessedly had as of yet no traffic. So we are appreciative of all the efforts of the county in leading this effort forward, working with our healthcare partners, and we're here to serve in any limited capacity that we can. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Monsignor Rubino. And uh, you brought up a great piece, which is the telemedicine um, opportunity that is out there for pretty much everyone, I think, whoever your health insurer is. And so please utilize those kind of services now so that you don't have to get out and be with other people until you've actually spoken to a healthcare provider. And lastly, I'd like to bring forward uh, Doreen Summers, who is with the VA hospital, and she is with us uh, via telephone. Uh, Doreen? Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon. The Erie VA Medical Center continues to actively screen all of our veterans, visitors, and to limit our access to our community living centers for the visitors for only hospice care. 
We're currently working on our plans to open a drive-through testing for our VA patients, which is expected to begin late next week and will be available as needed. The option is for veterans who have a specific order from their VA provider stating that they meet the criteria to be tested, and more information will follow regarding this drive-through testing. We encourage all of the veterans to stay at home unless they have an urgent medical need. We continue to offer our veterans care through virtual and telephone appointments for any of the routine appointment needs that they have, so they can still receive the care in the comfort and safety of their own homes. Specifically for behavioral health, we understand this is a very stressful time and we want to reiterate to our veterans that our behavioral health team is here to assist them virtually, telephonically, and in person if absolutely necessary. We encourage our veterans and their families to visit our website, our Facebook, our Twitter pages to stay updated with all of the latest guidance and to learn what actions we're taking on a continual basis. It's important that we as a community continually maintain a mindset of preparation over fear. We continue here to work diligently to take appropriate precautions to lessen the spread of COVID-19. Please know we're all in this together. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Doreen, and, and thank you for what you continue to do for all of our veterans. And speaking of veterans, you know, when we are fighting this pandemic, we are really fighting a war, a war against a virus. And our veterans understand how serious this is and, and how difficult it can be. So thank you uh, again for your service to our veterans, but you know, thank you to our veterans for helping all of us to understand what we are in the middle of here. And I really want to be, say how grateful I am and I think our whole community is for the state of the, of the art hospitals and healthcare practitioners that we have in Erie County. We're truly blessed to have wonderful facilities who do have the state-of-the-art equipment to take care of us in our greatest time of need. So with that being said, I'm going to now turn it over to the media and ask for questions. The questions can be for me or for any of our four healthcare practitioner guests with me today. We'll start with Erie News, Erie News Now. Hi, Ken, it is all Kemper to be here, hoping this is working a little better audio-wise. It is, um, thank you. Can you tell me about that? Uh, all righty. What can you tell me about this hospitalized patient um, in terms of when, when he or she was admitted? And then while we're on the topic of hospitalized patients, any update on the person who isn't an Erie County case but who was hospitalized last week? So the update that I have on the person who uh, is newly uh, diagnosed is that we got the report in uh, during the night, I believe. And so this is a, a new hospital admission, is my understanding, uh, came in, as I said, not uh, knowing that they were COVID positive, uh, but uh, tested once they were in the hospital. And I don't have any other further information on what their condition is like, uh, nor do I have any further information on the person who was hospitalized last week. Uh, I believe you're referring to the person who's not from our county, but was in a hotel here in our county. And I don't have any further information on that individual. Okay, so don't know if he or she is still in the hospital, anything like that? I do not. I believe that they okay, probably are, but I don't really know that, so I, I don't I haven't heard anything different. So I'm just assuming it's it's the status that I last knew. Um, Jet TV. Yep. Hi, Kathy Samir here. So uh, I have a question for you that I also would like uh, St. Vincent and Hammett representatives to answer as well. So I was speaking on the phone today with a primary care doctor, and they are not affiliated with Lee or. Uh, St. Vincent nor or St. Vincent or Allegheny Health Network and uh, UPMC Hammett, and they basically brought up the point that uh, they cannot refer their patients to either of those sites. So I guess what is or what's the suggestion from the county to do, as well as the hospitals that are there representing them? I am going to let the two healthcare networks answer that because they would certainly be much more knowledgeable about that than I am. So would one of you like to take that? Sure. We'll have uh, Dr. Jones take care of that. Um, so you're correct, Samir. Um, it, we work on the EPIC platform, which uh, is uh, our partner physicians work on also. And so an order needs to be placed in EPIC for us to draw that test and to process it. Remember, that test needs to be tracked and reported back, and so we can notify everybody uh, who needs to have that information in an appropriate fashion, the patient, uh, the health care provider, and the Erie County Department of Health. Uh, we are working on a system where patients who 
are not within the network who have a prescription may be tested, but that's not ready yet. We will let you know when that's ready. Um, but patients who do not fall within one of those two systems who want to be tested can always come to the emergency department and request testing. Now they have to meet criteria. We don't test everybody, but we test people who meet specific criteria for disease. So they have to have symptoms and fever and so forth, or maybe contact with somebody who is known COVID. Um, we work also very closely, I told you, with the Erie County Department of Health. And if they identify individuals at risk or with a symptom complex and with exposure, uh, they have been calling us and scheduling those patients to come to the emergency department for testing. And so uh, you may be involved in that type of partnership if the Department of Health finds that you're in contact with somebody who is uh, a known positive COVID patient. And we'll have Emily. Perfect. Shears. Can I get Emily from Hammett talking into that? Yeah. Hi, Samir. Um, we are working on a process um, to develop capabilities for um, outside providers to facilitate testing or a really specimen collection for their patients. Um, so as we, any new process, we're working on some details to make sure that we can get those results filtered back to us in the appropriate way. So we will be releasing information as we have it in that area. Perfect, and then really fast before uh, we move on to the next question, do you guys think there, I guess, is a risk of possibly exposing people if that patient that uh, is not a client just go to the ER and uh, they are COVID positive. Could you repeat the question in a way, not everyone quite understood what you're asking, Samir. So um, I guess, is there a risk of that person uh, who's getting tested for positive or for COVID-19 possibly passing that on when they go to the ER instead of just going to the, one of the centers? I'll have Dr. Jones will answer that. Um, so, there's two parts of the question. So you are somebody in the community who wants to be tested and come to the ER and requesting testing. Once we test you, we will tell you, you know, we won't know this result for four days. So you need to go home, you need to quarantine, you need to remove yourself from family members uh, and to, to really self-isolate. Uh, if you're sent in by the Department of Health for testing, we'll give you the same instructions and they will follow up with you also. Uh, so. Either way, same, same answer. Uh, if you think you've been exposed or you think you're symptomatic and have it, uh, we will tell you to self-quarantine at home until we have results. Uh, and then maybe you'll quarantine longer than that depending on the results. Okay, how about Erie Times News? Hi, Kathy, it's David. Um, going back to the patient in his, in his or her 80s that, was, um, that tested positive, uh, one, do you know if that person was transported to the hospital from a local nursing home? And then also your, your thoughts on our first patient that's older than their 60s. First, that you probably can classify as elderly. Your thoughts on having a patient that old test positive. Well, we know that um, at the older you get, the more dangerous this virus is. Um, I have no idea about any underlying conditions that this person may or may not have. But obviously, when you look at the deaths across the United States, they are certainly happening in uh, greater numbers in our older population. And we've been talking about that since day one, that this uh, is most dangerous to our elderly and those who have underlying conditions. So I am concerned that an 80-year-old um, has contracted this disease and, of course, is now um, in one of our hospitals. And the first part of your question was, did they come from a nursing home? Um, yeah. I, I, I do not believe so. I believe they were transported from their home to, um, to the uh, hospital. Thank you. Uh, talk, Erie. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's Joel Natale here. I have a question for Monsignor Rubino. Okay, we'll bring him up to the mic. Yes, All righty. Um, Monsignor, you know, uh, Mil Milk Creek Community uh, Hospital Behavioral Health is one of the top, you know, hospitals as far as uh, as far as mental health, uh, MHMR. Um, are we seeing any significant increase of of behavioral health issues because of the quarantine? Joel, I can't give you a specific number, but I can tell you we had a forum last night with the Jefferson Educational Society with three psychiatrists from behavioral health, and they noted that they were busier than they have been in terms of people calling in via telehealth or seeing people. So I can't give you a specific number, but I can tell you that there seems to be an increased activity. And based on the questions we had last night, it was a live Facebook stream thing. You could sense the anxiety in people and they try to respond to those questions. So I think they're responding to a need in a qualitative way. I just can't quantify it for you. 
Thank you. Um, Erie News Now. Hi. Just how big of a concern are the, the so-called snowbirds or people coming back from spending the winter elsewhere as we've uh, seemingly done a phenomenal job of really keeping the virus out of Erie County as much as possible. Just how much does that weigh on your mind, knowing that you've got people uh, likely starting to head back to our area as the weather improves? And any you know, further advice for them as well? It concerns me greatly um, when anyone comes back to our community who's been elsewhere, especially in an area where there might be a true community spread happening, and uh, may come back and they have no symptoms. Uh, they could go out and try to see their friends and their family and, and you know, fill the refrigerator back up with groceries because it's empty. They've been gone for months. And so they're going to spend a fair amount of time in the grocery store as they have many items to pick up. And often these people are also older. They're retired. That's why they're able to spend those months in uh, some place to the south in, in a warmer climate. So when they come back, that's an issue. So I have some suggestions. If you're coming back and, or you know somebody coming back, you might have a family member, a parent, um, do them a favor and go grocery shopping before they get back. Ask them to give you a grocery list. If you're a younger person, if you're the son or daughter of this person, for example, fill up that cart, get to their house, fill up their refrigerator so that they don't have to go to the grocery store. And then tell them they need to stay home for 14 days. And any further needs that they might have, you'll go and help them get it. And that way, uh, you won't be, ex and, and also don't go in their house. So if you can fill up the refrigerator before they get home, then you haven't had any contact with them. But once they're home, anything you bring to them needs to be left at the door. You can talk to each other from six feet away. They can stay in the front door of the house, and you can stay out on the sidewalk uh, six feet away or more. Um, wait for those hugs until this is all over, even beyond those 14 days. But um, you want to stay far enough away from them for those 14 days because they could be bringing COVID-19 back to our community. And of course, they need to watch for symptoms as they uh, are home for those 14 days. Jet TV. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you had any update regarding the 17 Erie City of Erie workers that uh, were self or self quarantining themselves after traveling. I do not. I do not have any information. That came right out of the City of Erie, and, and I don't have any information on that. Sorry. So then, I guess a follow up to that: uh, What is your reaction? I guess seeing, I guess the city employees like that still traveling after we are in the stay at home. Well, Order. first of all, we've asked people to stop traveling and stop sending their employees out to travel if possible, um, because that's dangerous for our community and obviously dangerous for that person who may have to get on a plane or be in another community uh, where the numbers are much, much higher than ours. And of course, when they come back, then they're not going to be able to work for 14 days if they're following the instructions that we've been given. So you're sending them out to do work, but when they come back, now they've got two weeks that they should be staying at home. Um, so. That's a problem for, I would think, for the business. So keep them home, keep them doing everything virtual, phone calls, emails. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of this pandemic happening now versus even 5, 10, 15 years ago is we have the opportunity and the ability to connect with people in a very real way today and yet still be socially distanced. So um, it concerns me greatly that we have, are still sending people out. I'm not, I don't know the circumstances around that, so I'm not judging. The city of Erie, I'm not judging a specific business, uh, but I am saying it's dangerous when we send people uh, away and have to have them come back to our community. Erie Times News. Uh, Kathy, I have a question, uh, if I can get an answer both from Monsignor Rubino and from Doreen. Um, how much trouble right now are the physicians at your places having getting their patients tested? Doreen, do you want to go first? Sure, Kathy, thanks. Um, at the Erie VA, we are having no problems at all testing our patients. All of the patients who have screened positive and meet the criteria for CDC and VHA testing have been tested at this time. So we are not having any issues with that. Thanks for the question. David Monsignor Rubino, to the best of my knowledge, we are not having issues testing our patients. Okay. Uh, talk Erie. Yeah, one more question about testing uh, for either the UPMC or uh, both uh, AHN. Uh, I'm hearing reports about the, uh, the lack of test kits, the lack of uh, reagents at the testing. Uh, one of the major uh, national labs is like 200,000 cases on a backlog, seven to nine days getting tests back. 
What is the state of the testing at your uh, at your networks? Hi, thank you for the question. Um, we are closely tracking all of those supplies right now. We are seeing a slight increase in the turnaround from commercial laboratories such as Quest for the collection center, um, but we are up and running and functional right now um, with no major issues. Um, St. Vincent, very, very same. Uh, we, ha we have enough test kits for the people who need tested. Uh, the turnaround time varies depending on the volume of tests that are sent out per day, uh, but typically it's taking anywhere from two to four days to get a test back. But we've had uh, no problem with the supply chain in terms of the ability to test. Just as a follow-up quickly, uh, what, where, what will it take for us to get from that very, very high bar for testing that you have to be symptomatic to a place where at least we're starting to test people that have been in close contact with a known positive case. Anyone could take that. Yeah. Sure, I can take that. Uh, you know, right now there's test kits being developed. There's some that are ready to go. But understand they need to be processed, deployed, uh, and put into operations. And many times, depending on the type of testing kit, point of care is easy to do. It's, it's done uh, by a nurse at a, at a bedside or if it's a machine-generated uh, result, those machines need to be calibrated. Um, it takes time to get them deployed to the right areas. What we're seeing now is deployment mainly to the, the major endemic areas, so you can get better control on what's going on in their areas. So what does it mean for Erie County? I suspect we're not gonna see it um, immediately. I think it's gonna be somewhat delayed in our community as compared to some of the more endemic areas like California and uh, New York, uh, but those will be forthcoming. Can I tell you when? I cannot tell you when. I just know it'll be in a supply chain and as soon as they're available, we'll have them. Erie News Now, do you have any last questions? I do. I'd like to just quickly follow up on WebTech yesterday after having another 24 hours to kind of digest that report. Any, any further thoughts, any further takeaways uh, from what your crews discovered out there um, in, in terms of your thoughts on whether or not WebTech should have that full waiver? I realize it's not within your purview to shut it down or anything like that, but in terms of enforcement, trying to keep everybody in the county safe as best you can. Sure, I have a little bit of a report I brought with me in case this question came up. So um, I, it was, it's uh, been reported back to me from my enforcement team that Wabtec implemented all the practices uh, in the emails that were sent to them. After uh, the team came back, they sent out a uh, written notice you know, asking for practices to be improved, but, which they had talked about while they were there, but they, we just like to have things in writing and that WabTech is very open to any further suggestions from um, our enforcement team. Um, we found the ins that the, ins WabTech found that the inspector's input was very valuable during their, during their tours of the buildings. Um, we did tell them that the governor's order does include changes in regards to vending machines, which uh, they're going to address. And, um, I think that's, uh, those, those are some of the high level points, but again, I read through it much more thoroughly after I was on yesterday. Uh, it sounded through the report that things you know, went well. They were very receptive. Uh, there was many things they were doing well and uh, we were pleased with, and there were some things that definitely needed some changes and they were very, very open to making those changes. So uh, we believe that they have done that or are in the process of doing it if they haven't. And, and we will be back to, uh, to continue to help them and assist them. You know, as I said, we're not out there to, uh, to be, um, what do I want to say, penal, um, penalizing businesses. We're out there to help them be compliant. So that's what we're trying to do, and we're willing to give our expertise to businesses. And actually, many of the calls we've got today has been interesting. They've been businesses that want to be compliant. They want to do better. They understand the seriousness of this. And so uh, I think WabTech is one of those also that understands the seriousness of this, and uh, we're willing to work with any business that wants us to help them. I know we talked about adjusting break times yesterday as one of the recommendations. Could you tell me any of the other recommendations that were detailed in that, in writing, you know, just so that you, in that correspondence, any other ones that you put into writing and said, hey, we'd like you to do these things? So uh, one of them was to uh, use tape to show employees where um, six feet, what, what that looks like to them. And so they did that in certain areas where uh, it was very necessary because there was just more people in the building. And so um, 
that could help them visually see this, the six foot thing. They also uh, asked them to, to make verbal announcements over their loudspeakers on a regular basis um, and just reminding employees on an ongoing basis that uh, this is what they need to be doing. And then um, at the end of the shift, everything needs to be thoroughly cleaned, but even during the shift that there would be, um, I think they have a safety officer who would be responsible for you know, going around and, and continually wiping off machines and tools. And that was the other thing, uh, a tool that might be used by more than one person, you know, making sure that that is cleaned off in between um, different people using it. So it's those, those type of suggestions that we wanted to make sure were implemented. And uh, you're breathing a little easier now after getting this report. Are you feeling more confident, uh, you know, in, in how things are going out there? Um, I'll be confident um, when I don't see any cases coming out of there. So that's, <laughs> you know, you got a lot of people working in a place that, um, you know, you can do everything you can to try to protect, but you still have a lot of people coming in and out of there, and that does concern me no matter what uh, precautions are taking place. I mean, it's a concern, I'm sure, every day for our hospitals who obviously have great quality standards that they are utilizing. Um, but this virus, as we know, is deadly and this virus is, um, it, it actually kills pretty easily. In fact, uh, that's one of the questions people are like, how do I clean it? Almost any household cleaner will kill it. But um, it, it's contagious, it's very contagious. So uh, anybody who's got a lot of people in a building in some places have to, as we said, our medical centers are one of those places, uh, it has to be extremely diligent all the time. Uh, you know, every doorknob that somebody might touch. I mean, think about even just going into a restroom and, and what you might touch in that restroom. And so that's where everyone needs to be extremely diligent about uh, washing their hands more times than you've ever done in your life on a daily basis. Uh, you know, they talk about the surgical wash, you know, what we've all seen those surgeons on TV, on TV shows and movies, and how much they're washing their hands in between. And I'm sure Dr. Jones could speak to this much better than me, but um, we, uh, we're all learning how to do this the correct way. And so uh, we all need to be doing that. And then until you wash your hands, don't touch your face, because if the virus is somewhere on you and you touch your face before you wash your hands, that's how it transfers. It's not going to jump off of my jacket onto my face, but if I have touched something and then I touch my face that has a virus, that's how it's going to um, potentially enter my body. So wash your hands, do what you need to do to sit, keep yourself safe. It's going to be up to each of us as a person to also keep ourselves safe. Our businesses can do the best they can do, but the human person has to also um, do their part in keeping this virus in check. Jet TV, do you have any last questions? Yeah, I have a couple. So I wanted to, I had an officer reach out. Um, I know we're not releasing specifically where COVID-19 cases are within Erie County, but um, our, I guess, first responders, specifically law enforcement, are they receiving a list of uh, where these positive cases live, just in case they were to respond to a call there or they told prior to arriving? So we are following uh, the standards that are being used uh, as far as we can tell across the Commonwealth and even um, states across this nation. We are not releasing a list, but we are putting those addresses into our CAD system. So if uh, an officer or an ambulance or a fire truck would be released to a certain address, they would be notified that there is a COVID positive case in that restaurant, or, I mean, that, and sorry, in that residence. Got it. And then uh, this next question is for uh, the health leaders in the room. Are any of you able to disclose uh, how many COVID-19 case, positive cases you guys have admitted to your hospitals? Uh, so at St. Vincent, we don't disclose a uh, number of patients or what their conditions are. Uh, I can tell you we've had no deaths at our facility, but we, we do care for COVID patients. Um, at UPMC Hammett, to protect all of our patients' privacy, we do not disclose that information. At LACOG, the answer is exactly the same. And uh, Doreen, do you want to speak for the VA hospital? Sure. Thanks, Kathy. We've admitted zero patients with confirmed COVID-19 COVID at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Erie Times News. Do you have any last um, questions? Kathy, you had mentioned earlier about certain types of businesses that were having some trouble following um, the, the enforcement 
um, of stay at home or uh, uh, life sustaining businesses. You mentioned campgrounds, golf courses. Is there a particular type of business that one you can specify that really seems to have problems with this, whether it's campgrounds, whether it's golf courses? Um, actually, with the campgrounds, most of them aren't open yet, so we're just informing them that they cannot open. And of course, many of those campgrounds have pools, and we're telling them they can't open their pools. So it's that kind of information that we're relaying to them. You know, we've heard a lot of reports about golfers out on the golf course, and uh, you know they're kind of just jumping on when they want to and and hitting the balls around there. Um, and the golf courses are telling us that they are chasing people off their golf courses when they find that happening. So I don't know that there's a specific business that's having trouble, but I think as the weather gets better um, and more and more people are outside um, and that's going to become more and more of an issue with people being in large numbers close together. I've heard some reports out of Presque Isle that there are just so many people out there um, on a really nice day and of course we all love Presque Isle but we need to make sure that we're social distancing. It's a lot of acreage. Hopefully we can find our own space to take our walk or to be out in nature out there uh, where we're not anywhere closer than six foot from another person. I have, you know, when I'm out walking, a lot of people will just like move off the sidewalk when somebody's coming their way and just try to keep that six foot distance. That's what we all need to be doing. So I just, um, I can't say there's a specific business though, David. And, and just to quickly follow up on Presque Isle, have you talked with DCNR officials about the concerns and, and discussions of, of the park closing in any way, shape, or form? Uh, my enforcement team, led by Karen Tobin, has been in contact uh, with DCNR. Um, uh, specifically, I'm not sure who they spoke with out there, but more than once they've uh, discussed this with them. They're working hard to try to enforce the social distancing out there. I would really plead to the residents of Erie County that you all do this, that you, you do it on your own, because the last thing I want to happen would be for the state to come in and say, we are shutting down all state parks with the gates locked at Presque Isle. Um, none of us want to see that happen. But if we don't, as I'll say, behave ourselves and keep our social distancing, the state will feel like it has no choice than to shut that down. And I think it's good for our mental health as, uh, you know, we were talking about the behavioral health, the anxiety, the depression, all of those things that we might see. And we've got, you know, four more weeks of social distancing at a minimum. Uh, we have got an, a stay at home order, I should say, at a minimum. We have got to find ways to help ourselves mentally and physically. And of course, one of those things is to get out and take a nice walk in a beautiful place like Presque Isle. It does wonders for all of us. So I don't want to see Presque Isle closed. I don't think anyone else does either. So please help us keep your distance from each other out there. Do not get in crowds out there. Last thing we want to see is the state enforcing uh, that the park is shut down. And we know that they have the ability to do that if they feel it's necessary. Takiri, do you have any final questions? Yeah, just one more, Kathy. It's for you. Um, I heard uh, from a Talk Erie radio listener uh, who is an employee of Mercyhurst University and found out about the one community acquired case from Matthew Rink's article at Go Erie this morning. What is your advice? Obviously, HIPAA regulations wouldn't reveal individual people, but do, uh, do businesses have an obligation to tell their employees if amongst the workforce has COVID-19. What is your advice to businesses? Businesses do not have that obligation. Um, I've been saying all along, if you have had close contact with somebody who is COVID positive, you know that already, or you'll know it very shortly because we have that team of contact tracing individuals who are talking to the COVID positive person, finding out who they've been near, deciding who actually is at risk of contracting COVID-19 from that positive case. And then they're reaching out and telling that individual, this is the case and you need to quarantine for 14 days. So if you work at Mercyhurst uh, and you have not been contacted uh, by the health department and uh, reading that article this morning is how I found a lot of details out about this uh, was that it's been quite a number of days now. And so if you have not, you have not been contacted by a health department, then you are not someone who's had close contact. Now we know that this is a community acquired, our one um, most likely community acquired 
uh, case, and that just goes to the point, just go through life right now thinking that every person you might come in contact with has COVID-19. Whether that's somebody you work with, somebody who's in your neighborhood, somebody you see at the grocery store, somebody that you just come across uh, in any other way in your travels, hopefully not too far from your home, but anything you do outside of your home, just have that in your mind. And that's what we all need to um, be thinking all the time. Well, with that, I want to thank you again for joining me. I want to thank our guests today, Emily Shears from UPMC Hammett, Monsignor David Rabino from LeCom Health, Dr. Wayne Jones from Allegheny Health Network St. Vincent, and on our phone today, Doreen Summers from the VA Hospital. I want to thank all of those who work at those great health care facilities uh, throughout our community. They are on the front lines, as is the health department workers, and they are doing uh, just a tremendous uh, service to all of us. So thank you to all of them. Thank you for joining me here today. All of you out there, thank you for helping us get up to that B movement in terms of social distancing. Let's make it to an A. I know our community can do it if we all pull together to stay home and to stay safe and to stay calm. Thank you.